How do you choose those beats, man? <laughs> so your everyday playlist? Yeah. I'm just assuming something will happen. Cool. Thanks for coming. This is, it's October already, um, which is kind of scary. So now we have uh, less than how many weeks till the end of the year? I don't want to think about it. Um, this is one heck of a resolution, man. But uh, I'll, I'll just get straight into it. Today we're going to um, have a chat from Seb. Um, Seb's a partner at Deloitte uh, for a, a very good cloud engineering team. And he's going to talk to us at, at a high level about how to make choices uh, about which clouds to use and how to kind of strategically align yourself with the cloud. And then after that, we're going to probably have a five minute break. Um, and we've got Edmund talking to us about um, using Golang on EC2, the things he's been learning, and we're going to see some demos, which I'm pretty excited about. So, Seb. Cool. Thanks, Scott. How's everyone today? Good. Good. Can you see me on the live stream? Hello. <laughs> this is one of those, I don't know, how do I know if anyone's on there? <laughs> All right, so I have uh, prepared a bit of a talk. I'm quite excited to, to do this. I haven't actually done a talk for the user group in quite some time, although uh, I put a lot of effort into make these things happen and I'm quite proud of, of what we have achieved so far. I don't know if you, um, if some of the newcomers, I guess, might not know, but we've uh, founded a, a nonprofit around this uh, community and have got a committee going and have you know some big plans of what we can do. So we've got a bit of a structure around it and we're quite excited to, to see where that takes us. Uh, this is our brand. Um, so I hope you like it. Um, this is the same curvature as AWS. I'm still waiting for the lawyers to call. They haven't yet. <laughs> <laughs> Game on. All right, so I, um, I want to talk about technical stuff, but that maybe isn't hands-on because Edmund, who's over there, is going to do the real tech deep dive stuff. So I've been talking a lot with my customers around cloud migrations, cloud journeys, and what sort of strategic choices you have to make. And so I thought this would be a, a fun, kind of interesting, thought-provoking topic. So, but before we get into that, what is all this cloud thing about? Why, why is everyone talking about this? And how, how big is I'm going to stand here so people can see me on there. So I, I went through, now I can't produce slides that are quite that beautiful, so I had sort of help to produce these slides. But I did uh, earlier this week. Um, as in yesterday, go through and update all these numbers and make sure that it's all correct. Uh, and I, I posted some links and I'll, I'll share the slides with you. So, because a lot of this content, I'll kind of rush through it to give admin the most um, time. But what we see is AWS is maybe bigger than we thought. Ooh. Right? Because we get a lot of this kind of marketing kind of stuff, and marketing is naturally designed to manipulate our perceptions. But when we peel away all of that marketing guff, we get some raw numbers. And I thought this was quite interesting because there's a number of things I want to call out to you. So one is AWS is the biggest, no surprise, but it's kind of surprising by how much, assuming Gartner knows what they're talking about. Then I thought the next one, well, Azure, no surprise there. I feel like a, um, a weather show, you know, this is the weather. Um, so, but the clouds are moving in over here now, and you can see rain is coming from here, and we have got Alibaba in third position. And this, I think, is quite surprising because you'd think normally Google would have more sort of market eminence, kind of like a Deloitte word, but it, it is a, a relevant word. So 7.7% for Alibaba. Kind of interesting, I thought. Now, the other thing that I think is interesting is the software as a service line over here is far greater than anything else. And everyone that I talk to always looks up the stack, software as a service, and then looks what they can go coming down. There's obviously some potential pitfalls with that kind of approach, but this is estimated as, well, 2018. Don't know how much estimation there is in that, but we see it's quite epically huge. So that is just a bit of a size perspective that we might not always see when we're here in Little Wee New Zealand. I thought then next it will be interesting to survey the actual top players a little bit more because part of this talk is about how to choose a player to go with and about how we might go about doing that. And there's a, a couple of, you know, these are obviously the, the big players, a couple of interesting things. We kind of see they've all been around for quite a long time. Two of them are e-commerce players. That's 50%. Admittedly, a small sample size, 
but still kind of interesting. They've been doing this for a long time, right? So um, 2002, it's more than like, what was it, 15 years or something ago? That's been around for a long time. So you can say that's matured a long time. Uh, we have got eight years for the Azure platform. We have got App Engine, 10 years. I remember playing with App Engine in my developer hands-on days and thinking, you know, this is quite phenomenal stuff. The fascinating thing with App Engine was that it was never about um, the underlying infrastructure. It was serverless. And I, I kind of think, well, now we talk a lot about serverless, but really serverless started 10 years ago. We just didn't call it that. And then finally, Ali Cloud, uh, e-commerce client or e-commerce um, company again, and also a long time ago did this for their own internal demands. And it's been a common trend. So you can see the top players have been doing this for a really long time. And so we find that naturally we kind of trust these players a bit more. But being able to identify which of these, because they're obviously all really competent. They all have done this for a really long time. So how the heck would you choose? This is kind of the essence of uh, what I want to thought provoke you into. So here we go. These are the <coughs> evaluation points that we want to consider. And I'll, I'll be happy to share the slides to you so you can take this content and you know have further thought provoking conversations with your colleagues. But we split it into three separate um, groupings. So we've got the capabilities. This is whiz bang features. How mature are they? How quickly do you release new features? Um, how wide can you go? How many locations? Even though you know this is an interesting one because we always deploy into Sydney, <coughs> at least for the most part. So maybe that's not so relevant, but you can choose. Um, choice degree of openness, obviously a double-edged sword, because heck, how do you know? Is are we, you know, in terms of deploying something into AWS, there's so many different options. How would you know what to choose? We've got commercials. This is really important. We often forget this actually because we focus on this here and it's got you know fancy innovation features. But this is really important. SLAs are fixed. You can't actually negotiate these. It is what it is. And if the cloud vendor says it's 99.9% .9 availability, then that is what it is. And this isn't a, something where you go and say, oh, but you know, if I pay you a million dollars, surely you can change it. No. The price is also what it is. You swipe your credit card. What? Credit card? <clears throat> I don't do that. My procurement team doesn't do credit cards. So interesting kind of challenges. Contracts, pretty non-negotiable. Maybe a surprise to your procurement team that's been doing this for a long time. And then, of course, the engagement style. How do you engage with the vendor? And when you think about if you're already a little bit down this path, how you might deal with your cloud provider, be it one or more. So I'll drill into each of these a little bit in more detail, walk you through some of these components and see uh, where we get to. Um, before that, I thought, well, this seems like a lot of research that we have to do to figure it all out. Surely someone does that for us already. And lo and behold, back to Gartner. Yes, they have thought it through already. So where are we at? AWS, clearly the leader. And I was, you know, I, I saw this and okay, everyone's probably, sort of, at least I've been watching this for a while. And I was like, well, where can I actually get an authoritative source where this is actually from? And I Googled it, like Gartner Magic Wandering Cloud you know, vendors and whatnot. I couldn't find it. And there were all these images that people had reposted. And so guess who would, of course, want to publicize this the most? AWS, because if you know, you're in that quadrant, you probably want to tell everyone. So I found a link <laughs> from AWS, which links you through the Gartner to a link that is seemingly impossible to find otherwise. Um, well. Um, we'll talk about the PaaS thing a bit more in detail. Uh, this has been quite significant in my own evolution of how I perceive cloud. And moving more down the stack, because my own cloud journey started with a more innovation aspect, and I looked at high-level developer services. And now I do more infrastructure services as part of my general role that I have. And I found that it's a whole data center ecosystem that we have to think about. And when you put a single EC2 instance out into the cloud, it's actually not as simple as following a wizard and saying, oh, cool, now I've got that in the default VPC. You actually have to think it through in more detail because you're actually building a whole data center out there. Certainly at scale, that's what you have to do. And this is non-trivial. This is quite technically difficult to do. OK, so let's say, got this. They still all look pretty good, really, all round. Um, 
be that as it may, maybe we want to dig a little bit deeper. All right, found some fact sheets, which I updated yesterday. <laughs> so <laughs> these are always growing. 69 availability zones, I checked it yesterday, it is correct. Uh, 22 geographic regions, it's correct. Now, I don't know how many of you guys know, but an availability zone can be any number of data centers. So that is a heck of a lot of data centers. Mm. That is a truckload of kit. We have got more regions coming, Cape Town, Jakarta, and Milan. Uh, I'm assuming this from the address website is actually correct, but it's kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's obviously huge. Um, Athena and EKS, fastest growing services. I thought that was kind of interesting as well because it's not the default service that normally you'd go to for AWS. So that's, that's kind of fascinating. Um, and my last point on this particular slide is this renewable source is 50%. Um, certainly I see especially large corporates care quite a lot about this. When you think about the energy consumption of 69 availability zones multiplied by how many data centers there are in each availability zones, that is a heck of a lot of energy. So this could be quite significant depending on your moral standpoint on carbon neutrality. Um, yeah, okay. And so I'll rush through these other two because this is the AWS user group and not the Google or Azure user group. So, but it's still kind of interesting. Um, you know, 61 availability zones, still pretty big. Mostly big data machine learning is where this comes in. Um, obviously containers, a bit of a thing of Google's, it's kind of where it all sort of um, came from. And um, big data ML capabilities is often where they try to present themselves as really mature. And then the final one that I want to show is the Azure 44 regions, pretty massive. Um, this true hybrid cloud thing, you know, I don't know how many, because I don't work in the Azure space too much myself, so I don't know how many um, have this Azure stack thing deployed actually, so it may actually be completely irrelevant, but um, they were certainly the, the leaders in that space. Moving right along. <laughs> All right, so the perilous journey to cloud, but maybe not so. Um, and I think the big thing that stands out, you could get this wrong, and it could be quite detrimental to your brand, to your existence even, right? Um, there's all sorts of Twitter notifications on how many S3 buckets have just been leaked and you know S3 buckets being public and whatnot, or someone leaking access codes on gists and GitHub and whatnot. So it can be perilous, but if you do things right and you think it through, it actually isn't. So it's all about that risk management. Um, now, everyone's kind of going down this path, and if you've seen by the size of it all that this is what's happening. Now, these are a whole bunch of US companies. I stole these slides from somewhere, but I did tweak them and change them, but I wasn't going to change all of these. So um, the big brands are all going for this. Right? That's the, the essential point of this. Um, the journey is long, but then it's that age old saying that it's not the destination, but the journey. But I think there's one milestone that matters in particular, which is when you turn that last server that isn't in the cloud off. So that is a milestone that is you know, a thing that is worth celebrating if you get there. And maybe you don't, because there might be some things that you identify as just not being suitable for cloud, and that's okay. Um, and we know it's still very early. You know, I think in 10 years, I might do the same presentation again, and I might say it's still very early. Who knows? <laughs> that's all depends on, on the, the scope. All right, my five points, I've got five slides on this, and then I'm done, and I can hand over to, to Edmund. Um, these are the five key questions that generally come up in conversation. And um, at the beginning, how do you contractually partner? People don't think this through. It's just swipe your credit card and then sign up. But then when it comes to scale, it's actually really, really difficult. Then when it comes to actually having that really big bill because someone forgot to turn off the redshift and oh shit, it was $10,000, suddenly this is uh, kind of important. <laughs> um, this, how far up the stack do you go? Really relevant, I'll go dig into that more. Portability through containerization, age old question, dig into that. Um, how much of a change is that I adopt? Uh, we'll cover the six hours of migrations and um, financial implications is my final point. Um, again, I'll, I'll be more than happy to share this with you and give you the, the content because it's quite good. All right, a lot happening on this slide. Key takeaways, main thing I want to point out, this shit's not negotiable. <laughs> That is the essence of the slide, right? So um, if your procurement team 
would like to negotiate terms, they probably aren't. Um, and it might be surprising, but you have to go through that journey and you have to go and have those conversations because you need to go and lead your executive team on this journey. Um, so your procurement company is not going to be happy. Your finance team is going to be challenged. Your legal department is going to be challenged. Um, and I certainly know from working on, on larger engagements where you know the negotiations go back and forth, like possibly for months even, and um, this is a different arrangement. <laughs> and it may come as a bit of a shock. So um, the key point is to do this early on because it could take quite a while to get through this. Cool, All right. So how far up the stack do we go? There's obvious benefits for going up, right? Reusable building blocks, less management overhead, more innovation, but lots of lock-in. And maybe you don't like that. Maybe it's a concern for you to commit to a particular vendor so heavily. It doesn't mean that you can't use AWS or any other vendor. The key being that it's maybe harder to get out, but at least you perceive it that way. And certainly um, a lot of the uh, European financial institutions are building heavy open source stacks around the cloud because that is their way of perceived flexibility. But it's a trade-off because as you go down the stack and you get perceived portability, you have a management overhead that could be quite significant. So it's finding the right trade-off and knowing what that is and thinking it through. And it's a, it's a structured decision that needs to be thought through. And maybe it's a combination of both because you might find some cases really need to be further down the stack, maybe containers or maybe even lower, and some you're quite happy to go really high. But it's uh, important to understand the difference between the two. Um, containerization, this is like a, a religious debate, right? And there's actually really pragmatic, obvious reasons for why it's a good thing. Um, and it's really good to just get those off the table at the start. So, um, and I don't know, does everyone know what containerization is? Um, essentially, this box here would normally say guest OS, uh, <laughs> and this would say virtualization. Um, but otherwise, it's kind of exactly the same, right? But um, the main thing being that you can have an easy way of deploying an app with all of its dependencies, and the platform is all taken care of. So the whole idea being that you can use sort of a Git-like workflow to go and deploy updates of your environment. Well, so there's your portability, because you might build it here, it might work there, it might work there, it will probably work on your laptop. Um, although I remember a couple of years ago trying to mock DynamoDB before the DynamoDB um, on-prem thing was there, and it was pretty difficult. <laughs> so beware. Um, and the final you know, utilization is a kind of an interesting one. I actually think if you consider a T2 Nano as a potential container, then to a degree, because the cloud gives so many automation points, that you could argue that maybe that is a bit like containerization. Um, but certainly from a utilization perspective, if you can spread it wider, then you obviously get um, higher overall utilization of the cores in your data center, which is why originally Google went for this stuff with the ball. Um, okay, moving along more. This one, I really like this one because um, there's six R's. You only see four. Anyone got an idea of which two are missing? Retire. Retire. Turn it off. <laughs> that was not on. And there, there's one more because you can turn it off or you can do nothing. You can also do nothing. <laughs> Retain. Yes. Um, so you can do nothing, or you can turn it off. Um, and so as you as you move across these, there's obvious impacts, and there's key considerations. And in any kind of on-prem portfolio analysis, you always look at where these will fit, and assess. You know, like it says, one size doesn't fit all. Some things are going to be worth rehosting, and others are not. And obviously, the the effort. It's kind of like a, I think of it like a, any kind of investment strategy greater the risk, greater the return. So this one could be pretty risky. Mm. Blown budgets and all sorts, pretty scary. 
but the returns could be phenomenal flexibility. So, and obviously over here, it's a pure TCO kind of discussion. Um, although we can do a lot of infrastructure automation as well. So we shouldn't forget that. And I've seen a lot of business cases that have focused really heavily on total cost ownership when they actually forgot that there's all sorts of automation capability and all sorts of um, optimizations that you can do. My final point is quite significant financial implications. I remember a couple of years ago working with one of my customers and they asked me about the EBITDA and how all this AWS usage was going to be impacting their EBITDA. And I was like, but I'm like the Java developer on the project. Why are you asking me this question? So it's like always a creative day. Right, so I went and I, I Googled it. Um, and at the time I was running my own company, so therefore it was kind of um, obvious that I should probably learn what that is. But in terms of this kind of capitalization up front, it doesn't mean that this on-demand pricing doesn't make sense, but it means that the business processes don't match it. And so the way that the business standard operates doesn't fit with this model. And so there's a bit of an allergic reaction and being able to cover that off up front. The foreign exchange rate, in fact, I was struggling with this one this morning. I was having a conversation with my team. One of our customers, um, they've quite a large AWS bill, and uh, they moved to an um, enterprise model with AWS, and that meant that they had to change to US-based bill. But our internal billing was working on tens of dollars, so which exchange rate to apply gets quite fiddly and the bigger the bill, the more interesting exchange rate fluctuation there is. And so you get into all sorts of funky uh, hedging of exchange rates. And uh, it, it can get quite fun, I can assure you. It's a great puzzle. Um, but it can have significant blunders if you don't do it right. So look, I'll, I'll share this um, around, send it through to you. Hopefully it's thought-provoking content. And um, my final summary slide is one that you've already seen before. Thank you very much. So, So yeah, we're just going to break break five. Um, bathrooms over there. Grab a drink of water or whatever. Um, just need a few moments to set up. Ready at all? Yes. Thank you. 
I forget now how to do my smart phone. Um, so we're getting deep um, now. Edmund's with us today. Uh, Edmund, Edmund was one of you, uh, you know, part of the audience. Um, slogan away every day and then came to us and said, hey, I want to speak. And we're like, yes, someone someone came and wants to share. So um, we want you to do the same thing, please. Um, we can't have a, a community user group without the community coming to talk and share. Um, and if you guys don't, then I'll have to, or Seb will have to talk again. And all oh, right, let's go, let's go. <laughs> Thanks. Not again, um, not again, please. <laughs> <laughs> Edmund. It's... Uh, so we're going to learn about Go. Yep. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, when I uh, made the decision that I want to be a programmer, I did a lot of research. And one of the things that I researched was uh, the question, how do I become a programmer? And uh, I did a lot of research in uh, uh, one of the things that I learned is that uh, learning between three to seven languages is uh, is like the best way to go uh, about you know becoming a very very uh, good programmer. And uh, I tend to do things you know the old school way, <laughs> and uh, uh, that's what that's the uh, that's the approach that I uh, that I took. Uh, Go is a open source uh, programming language that makes it easy to uh, build efficient and reliable software. Uh, it has a syntax similar to uh, C, that is uh, C, the uh, programming language. And uh, uh, one of the things that I learned about Go is that uh, a lot of people are calling it the uh, server and uh, cloud language now. I myself haven't explored those features that makes Go the server and uh, uh, cloud language, but uh, this is uh, Amazon Web Services Meetup, <laughs> and uh, uh, this is Amazon Cloud, and I felt like you know it would be a, a good thing for you guys to to know. And uh, I'll also say you know uh, do your own research. Uh, uh, one of the things that I one of the reasons that I decided, one of the reasons that one of the reasons that I, one of the reasons that I decided to learn Go, uh, because there's some uh, there's some projects that uh, that I want to work on later, and uh, 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 robotics is something that I'm interested in, and uh, learning different programming languages uh, 
Uh, I'm already familiar with Python and uh, uh, I know Java and I felt like, you know, learning uh, something like uh, Go will uh, prepare me to uh, uh, do, do stuff at, a, at like a robotic level. And uh, the other reason is that uh, I want to understand programming uh, very well so I can uh, help people that want to learn how to, uh, how to program. And uh, so, yeah, uh, that's uh, me back in the state. Uh, it's uh, any of you guys can, can do this. Uh, it's a VEX robot. Uh, I robotics, you know, takes so much time. I only managed to uh, program the uh, uh, motors and uh, the joystick to drive the robot around. But uh, this thing here has, has like about five sensors. And uh, 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 I even get a chance to program the, uh, the arm. The arm, you know, opens up and picks things. And uh, uh, it powers off a 7.2 volt battery. And uh, uh, part of my project was to try to use a solar panel to, you know, make it run. And uh, my program scale wasn't one point. And uh, uh, that's like part of the reason I stopped uh, what do you call it, uh, working on that project. But uh, 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 yeah. Uh, these are the things that I'm going to cover today, uh, deploying Go Web Apps and uh, Go Server to Amazon EC2. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about uh, Amazon EC2 and uh, uh, they, uh, talk about uh, data structures uh, that are fundamentals in Go. And uh, 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 one of the reasons that I decided to focus on these data structures because uh, they, they could be new concepts for people coming from uh, Python development background and uh, Java development background. And uh, these data structures, uh, pointers, slices, and struct, uh, make up the core components of, uh, of the Go Web application. Uh, uh, after that, I'm going to cover uh, the Go server, uh, the Go Web app. And uh, at the end, I'm going to try to do a demo. Hopefully, it works. <laughs> Uh, uh, even I've prepared, and then uh, take your questions at the end. I'll be around. And uh, uh, before I get into it, uh, I want to say, you know, the web application. Uh, it's uh, it's it's very basic, but it's supposed to function like a Wikipedia page. When you go to Wikipedia, uh, you go to read a bunch of text, and uh, you can log in and edit the uh, Wikipedia page. Uh, yourself. Uh, uh, this talk is aimed toward uh, mid-level and uh, people who are uh, starting out. Uh, uh, also, you should have like uh, some uh, programming experience, uh, basic knowledge of uh, web technologies, computer uh, networks, uh, Linux and familiarity with uh, AWS. Uh, you don't have to know these stuff at a very, very deep level. Uh, just the basic, like, you know, what's SCP? Uh, uh, what happens when uh, a client uh, try to request uh, some data from the server? Uh, it's, it's very beneficial. Uh, the, other thing, the other thing that I'll point out is that uh, using my experience from traveling, uh, I'll say, you know, spending any time between uh, uh, eight months to a year on a language, you know, uh, helps you learn very well. And uh, uh, I've been in Wellington now for a year. Uh, I'm from Colorado. And uh, being here in Wellington for a year have helped me uh, learn the, uh, the city well. I know where to go and buy cheap eggs. I know where the... Uh, <laughs> Uh, grocery. Uh, uh, I, I know where the uh, uh, post office is at, and uh, 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 so these these are these are things that I won't know if I were to say you know come here for like uh, uh, two weeks vacation or a month, uh, and then uh, leave. Uh, 
uh, same thing with programming. If you spend about you know eight months to a year, you won't know uh, everything about it, but it will help you you know uh, 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 use the language to create uh, powerful applications. Uh, now I don't know Wellington as well as uh, ninety nine percent of uh, people in this room. <laughs> in faith, in fact, uh, one day I went to Mount Victoria for a hike and. Uh, I took a different route than I normally take, and uh, I got lost. <laughs> uh, I got lost. I ended up by the uh, by the airport, and uh, I was like, "Oh shoot! How do I get back to uh, to uh, uh, a Courtney place? That's my savior. Every time I walk, uh, every time I go too far away from the city, uh, I try to uh, uh, get back to a Courtney place. And luckily, luckily enough for me, I asked for directions and. Uh, uh, found my way, you know, find my way back home. Uh, uh, same thing with, you know, a programming language. Uh, eight months to a year, you'll build a you'll build a you'll build a good foundation. Uh, uh, there's just some things that you'll uh, need to like pick up later. Uh, but yeah, just uh, keep the time frame in your mind. Uh, I already talked about this. Uh, So yeah, Amazon EC2, uh, most people in this room uh, know what it is. Uh, I went on and uh, created one. Uh, it's already up and running. Uh, uh, basically, just go through the steps, uh, select an image. I selected the uh, Red Hat uh, distro uh, because I'm running Fedora as my uh, desktop operator, as my desktop just to stay consistent. and. Uh, uh, after you go to the uh, 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 setup, uh, you download the uh, a key pair. Uh, sorry. Uh, after you go through the setup, you download the key pair. The key pair is your credential to uh, log into the server and uh, using uh, the SSH to uh, remotely log into it. Uh, so this here, uh, I apologize for the gray area, uh, the SSH command using the key pair, and uh, down here using SCP. SCP is to uh, uh, copy files from your local host to your to the to the uh, 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 from from your local host to your remote host, and. Uh, uh, so yeah, the other thing that I. The other thing that I forgot to point out is that uh, I created my EC2 the old way. Uh, if you're going to do any work in a production environment, uh, I recommend you use uh, uh, AWS Elastic Beanstalk. Uh, I use it in, in the past to deploy uh, Django and uh, 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 Django and Python web application. Uh, and uh, I'll also recommend uh, uh, AWS SDK for Go. Uh, those two are probably you know better than uh, uh, going through the steps of uh, manually you know uh, doing everything yourself. Uh, uh, you learn more, and that's what I'm after. You know, doing things uh, the old school way, <laughs> uh, but uh, using uh, SDK and uh, uh, Elastic Beanstalk uh, highly recommended. But yeah, after you uh, create the uh, uh, EC2, uh, select your destroy stuff from running, uh, manual SSH into the uh, EC2 instance. Uh, the next thing you want to do is uh, uh, update the uh, update the image, make sure that it's up to date, and uh, install Go. Uh, This is the, uh, 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 in most Linux distro, it's similar. Uh, apologize about the stretch here. Uh, but installing Go in all Linux distro, it's uh, all of the, all of it, you know, similar. Uh, uh, one thing that I'll point out is that uh, Go files live in a 
directory call a workspace. That's like the uh, default setting in the Go community. Uh, you create a workspace and then you create uh, the uh, source directory and uh, you create the package directory and you create a bin directory and uh, maybe there's some other uh, things that I forgot. Uh, uh, but yeah, create, in, install Go and uh, uh, create a workspace uh, uh, so that you can uh, be ready to start your uh, code development. And uh, I'll also point out point out that uh, everything I did came directly from uh, this documentation, writing Go Web application, and uh, I implemented uh, everything on this uh, page up to here. The two things that I didn't I didn't implement is the uh, template caching and uh, validation. Uh, but uh, if you want to do what I did, uh, it's all. Uh, it's all up here in this article. <laughs> all right. Uh, the three data, the three data, three, the three data structures that uh, can be new to people coming from uh, Python uh, and Java are uh, pointer slices and structs. Uh, a pointer, it's a uh, a pointer is a variable that points to a memory address of another uh, of another variable. And uh, to understand pointers, uh, you have to understand like uh, you have to understand uh, how computer memory works. Uh, uh, let's say you let's say that uh, the computer memory is uh, it's an address. Uh, it's, let's say let's say that the computer memory is an array with addresses from uh, zero to a hundred, and uh, you have this uh, you have this uh, you have this uh, this application Visual Studio uh, open. Uh, let's say that Visual Studio takes up uh, memory addresses from uh, zero to fifteen, and uh, uh, you have something else like the LibreOffice open, and the LibreOffice takes up you know spaces from uh, takes up memory addresses from uh, uh, 16 to 16 to 30 uh, to access uh, to access these uh, to access this application or to access a, to access a variable in memory uh, you can uh, uh, refer to uh, the pointers you you can refer to the address that they're that they're located in and uh, 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 I prepare you know uh, some sample code uh, just to show you uh, what I'm talking about it might be uh, uh, a little bit uh, abstract to uh, ask pointers. Uh, a struct is uh, it's a data structure built on top of array, and uh, uh, a struct is not an array. Uh, I would say that to understand, you know, uh, I'm sorry, did I say struct? I'm sorry, I, I meant uh, slices. <laughs> Uh, a slice is, is a, uh, or a slice is a, a slice is a data structure built uh, on top of array. And uh, to understand a slice, you have to understand like you know how array works. And uh, a struct, uh, it's a data uh, structure similar to a, a class if you're in uh, uh, Java and uh, Python. And uh, uh, So I have like you know pointers that go. Uh, that's uh, these are sample code that I prepare. Uh, a name is a variable, and then city is a pointer that uh, points to a memory address of name. And uh, if you do like uh, uh, down here, I just have like a simple print. Uh, uh, so you can see here. Uh, this is printing the uh, the string name uh, Willington, and uh, uh, down here prints the actual uh, 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 memory address. And uh, to get the value that 
the pointer is pointing to use like the star. Uh, and uh, uh, slices is, uh, is very straightforward. Okay, what did I do wrong? Slice sample, what what please? Uh, yeah, I'll give it another try one more time. Go run slices that go. Okay, I'm just gonna pop over this. Uh, uh, it works just like a Python list. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, what happened, what was supposed to happen and just print everything up here. Uh, that's how you create a slice using a, a function called make. And uh, to add stuff into the slices, you just use the slice index. And uh, 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 this is how you can just like, you know, use the powerful uh, features of slice that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, an array might not uh, have. Is city info an initial one? Hmm? City info is unusual. City info so is kind of like a null pointer. Yeah. <clears throat> what if you just uncomment that line 10? Line 10, line Because that seems to be where the error is. 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, sorry. Line 11. Your programming interest. Yeah, let's figure it out. I'm trying to keep this as short as uh, possible. The... There you go. Uh, <laughs> you don't need that to reflect what value is. So let's see, the info is already this. It should refactor it to be pizza slices. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, uh, uh, obviously, there's more, there, obviously there's more functions to slices than uh, what I just uh, prepared here. Uh, but that's just uh, to show you how it works. Uh, and it, again, it's very, very basic stuff. Uh, uh, this is a, a struct. Uh, Go doesn't have uh, classes, so you have to use like a, a, a struct. Uh, this is an example of uh, uh, using it up here, uh, creating a struct. Uh, Creating a struct called uh, Wellington. Uh, that's the long way to do it. And then again, these are just Wikipedia <laughs> numbers. Uh, if you know more, uh, like the population and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, if I just do run. So that's how uh, uh, a struct works. And to get what's inside the, uh, uh, the struct field, you just use the dot notation. <laughs> and uh, I went over these, I went over these three basic things because uh, they're basically like the core uh, component of uh, the web application that I created. And uh, I'll show you in a minute. Uh, Uh, but uh, uh, this right here is a simple implement, simple implementation of a Go uh, uh, web server. Uh, just importing uh, FMT is like uh, 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 a package that lets you do uh, uh, printout, like system that out that printout like in Java or uh, uh, the uh, uh, print function in Python. The log uh, is another package that uh, lets you listen to what's going on <laughs> on uh, on uh, on the server on the server while while it's running. And uh, usually, when you do this, you create like a log file 
so it keeps track of what ha what's happening uh, 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 while the server is running. Uh, I didn't implement that. Uh, this is just a basic, basic uh, uh, example of uh, uh, creating a web server. And the uh, this package here, it's uh, is what lets you uh, implement the uh, uh, the client and the uh, server in Go. And uh, uh, I'm going to try to uh, run the uh, server and uh, I have it running in on port uh, 8080 and uh, if I go to my browser here and uh, it says hi there and then if I type in Wellington I can spell Wellington right, uh, and then it redirects whatever you put on here uh, into the web page. Uh, so that's that's the web that's the web server, and uh, uh, now this is the uh, web application. Uh, uh, similar implementation, just the web server with some extra packages that are uh, added to it. Uh, I want to cover memory, but uh, so the I the IO util package uh, lets me access information in memory, uh, uh, and uh, the HTML and forward slash template package it lets me create. Uh, uh, templates in Go. Uh, if you ever created a, a web application using uh, uh, Python and Django, Django has some built-in templates, so it makes your life easier as opposed to uh, uh, trying to write everything like raw HTML from scratch. Uh, but yeah, uh, so I uh, spent time talking about uh, pointer slices and struct uh, this right here uh, uh, makes up my uh, web page uh, or a web application that's like the structure of the web application in memory uh, i have a, a struct called page uh, the title uh, that's like the title of the page and uh, the body the body is a slice of uh, of, uh, of type of type uh, byte and uh, 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 the other thing the other thing that I, the other thing that I'll, that I, the, the other thing that I'll uh, point out is that uh, strings in go I'll, uh, are read only slices uh, so trying to modify uh, something that's read only uh, 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 isn't uh, isn't easy that's why up here I think uh, I think that's why up here, down here, the uh, uh, code documentation uh, uh, shows to shows to do uh, shows to do uh, 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 the body as a uh, byte as opposed to a, a string. Uh, I could be wrong, but I think uh, <laughs> that's why they uh, uh, did that. Uh, but yeah, this essentially creates the uh, creates the, creates the web page in memory. Uh, now to uh, to save it into a persistent storage, uh, you have to use a, 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 a database like MySQL or PostgreSQL, or save it into a file. Uh, 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 in my case, uh, keeping everything simple, uh, uh, it gets it gets stored into a file. And uh, this, fun this, this is how you declare a function in Go. Uh, pardon me. Uh, this right here, it's a pointer receiver. Uh, again, going back to the example that I showed you, how you will uh, pull up uh, information from uh, memory. If you go back to my the pointer example that I talked about, uh, this is what's going on here. It's getting what's, what's, it's getting what's, it's getting what's created in memory. Uh, cast in here, and then uh, 
this is how you will, you know, uh, store it into a, a text file. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, p.body and uh, the file name, getting these two in here. And uh, uh, the 06, 0600 is a read and write permission on Linux. If you're, uh, if you're gonna uh, store stuff, uh, and uh, the rest of the application are just function that are, are just functions that do different things uh, using the uh, uh, concepts of uh, struct slices and uh, pointers. Uh, uh, this one loads the page, uh, uh, viewing the page, uh, lets me edit it, and uh, I'm not going to go over the rest of them. Uh, uh, but essentially down here, main calls everything. And uh, 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 so yeah, let me try and see if I, see if I, if I can run this uh, to Wikipedia, wiki.go. Uh, it's up and running. Now I have it uh, running on port uh, 8082 because the web server uh, it's running on port 80, and sometime, you know, if I try to run the same thing on the same port, it says, you know, it, it's already been used or it's already uh, uh, busy. Uh, uh, so if that does what it's supposed to do, uh, yay, then I can come here. Uh, And then you can just add to uh, what's already here. Uh, uh, it's just a it's just a form that lets you, you know save things, and uh, you can go back to it. Uh, um, so that's that's basically the uh, the web the web application uh, up and running. Uh, it's not too uh, too fancy. I didn't implement. Uh, Bootstrap uh, or uh, the other Zerg Foundation. Uh, uh, I just went over, you know, doing it from uh, from scratch. Um, now, uh, moving this to uh, Amazon EC2 just uh, is very simple. Just using this command here, uh, the bottom one. Uh, uh, web, uh, yeah, just using this here and then change the name, the name of the file so you can just uh, zip the whole thing, put it in a zip folder, and then uh, uh, SCP, SCP into uh, Amazon EC2. Uh, uh, with, uh, with Amazon SDK or uh, AWS uh, CLI uh, or uh, uh, AWS Elastic Beanstalk, there's a command called EB deploy, and uh, it makes your life, you know, way, way easier. Uh, but uh, uh, I like doing things the old way. It's, uh, it's cool. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to go back to my uh, 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 EC2 instant. And uh, there's there were two things that uh, yeah there, there there were two things that I forgot to cover uh, that I modification that I did and uh, that is uh, uh, when you create an EC2 instant uh, I think by default uh, port 22 comes open uh, and uh, if you're gonna do stuff from scratch uh, like I did uh, you have to uh, uh, change the uh, security group setting. I uh, I uh, basically I went off, went on and uh, added. Uh, I went on and opened uh, port eighty eighty and uh, uh, port eighty eighty two uh, to do the same thing that I did on my local host uh, uh, and uh, using the uh, using the uh, uh, DNS name. I can get it here. 
So yeah, once you've opened up the port, uh, uh, you want to grab this and uh, I already prepared uh, some of these stuff here. You want to grab that and uh, put it in here and just uh, do colon and uh, 80, 80. Uh, oh, I have to SSH into it. It's up and running, but uh, I need to tell it. Uh, uh, so I'm inside the uh, uh, EC2. I. Uh, I went through the setup of, uh, you know, creating the same environment on my local house up there. And uh, 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 so the web server is up and running on EC2 and uh, See if I can uh... no. <laughs> okay. I'm wondering if it's best we move on. The pizza smells really good. Yeah. And it might be getting cold. Pizza. Pizza. Thanks, Ralph. Right. Pizza. 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 Do you want to stick around in, in case there's any go questions? You're yeah. obviously a, an expert in go, so yeah. if anyone is um been coding and learning, um, going through the same journey as Evan. Yep. Um, come have a chat. Yeah. But uh, thank you very much for sharing. Yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. Um, thank you. Guys. Pizza. Yeah. All right. Pizza. Lots of them. So get them up. Probably too much. <laughs> I heard that is the server. I like the lines. Yeah. 